So every once in a while a viewer will remind me that I should be doing something that I'm not. And in this case, there was a comment from, from Don up above here, I'll post it. And he mentioned that uh, I haven't done a review of my SP3624 uh, DIY laser I built about a year ago. And uh, I thought it would be a good thing to cover here. He brings up a good point. And uh, he actually wasn't the only one. Uh, someone was in my shop here a couple weeks ago and mentioned, uh, mentioned the same thing, asked me, hey, if you were building this again, what would you do differently this time? And it's a really hard question to answer, but I thought about it a bit. So I thought I'd put all of that together in a video here and tell you things I, I'm very happy I did uh, as far as building this laser and certainly things that, uh, you know, I could certainly have done better. And, and with that, we'll, that's really enough context to get going here. And uh, we'll start from there. So I'll start with a bit of history here. About 18 months ago, I decided I needed an, a second CO2 laser. My Muse 3D uh, is still running. It works great. I use it uh, on a fairly regular basis, but for some of the projects I was doing, I was consistently running into the workspace being too small and working with materials and thickness of materials that a 40 watt laser just couldn't cut. So I decided I was going to, to start shopping around. Now I looked at all the big laser manufacturers, uh, you know, Boss, FSL, uh, Aon, you, you name it. I looked at all of them and the price ranges were kind of shocking to me. Uh, they ranged anywhere from about $7,000 up to ten dollars or $11,000, uh, much more than I wanted to spend. So what I did was I kind of knuckled down and said, I don't want to spend that kind of money, I want to spend half of that. And uh, I started designing my own laser and it was this, the SP3624. 36 inches wide, 24 inches deep on the workspace and it was a 90 watt laser. So it, it met all of the requirements I had at the time and uh, a year later i'm still using it it hasn't failed once on me at least not not at a point where it impacted a, a job i was trying to get done uh, i've done some some tweaks to it here and there to to make some improvements but all in all it's been pretty solid and i'm really happy i did it because i did it for about four thousand dollars now if you haven't seen the video series i did on on designing and putting this together uh, click up in the corner here it's a seven part series and if you're thinking of either maybe building that laser, the, the SP3624, or you know maybe designing your own, there's lots of kind of tips and things I ran into and why I made some of the design choices. So the, go watch those if you're looking to build your own laser. Now what I wanted to do in the remainder of this video is kind of go through some of the highlights and lowlights of the SP3624 after a year of use. Uh, I made some design choices that I'm very happy with and certainly some that I look at in retrospect and wonder why I did what I did. Not too many, but there are things where I could have easily made a much better design and uh, I'll, I'll kind of go over some of those as well and just some of the things where uh, I was disappointed in the end. And uh, we'll start with uh, the things that I ended up liking about this project and the laser operation itself. So on the pro side, I'm definitely happy with the workspace size, uh, the 36 inch by 24 inch workspace, that's 900 millimeters by 600 millimeters. Uh, I definitely am very happy I made that choice. I've not ever had to cut a piece that won't fit on there. Uh, doesn't mean I won't in the future and I'll have to find some way to work around it. But uh, for now, it's definitely, uh, you know, the, the choice that I, uh, of workspace that I needed. Uh, next on the list here is the power. I'm glad I went with 90 watts, even, even more so than, than 100 watts. Uh, once you kind of cross that 90 watt boundary, you start running into much bigger power supplies, much bigger tubes, and I mean bigger, they're longer, so everything takes more space. It also costs more money. There's a bit of a price jump once you get into the 100 watt range. So uh, I'm very glad that I stuck with 90. 90 is certainly ample power. I, I haven't really found much that I can't cut that that is part of my normal operation. So, um, you know, no regrets there. Um, now, when I put the optics in this laser, the mirrors and the lens, uh, rather than go with the $5 variants that you'll find in most lasers and even these, some of these higher end lasers, uh, I, I opted for higher end optics. They cost probably three times as much, but I have no regrets. 
The mirrors I used are silicone substrate with gold film on top and they're very durable. Uh, they are also very efficient so you don't lose a lot of power. And when I picked the lens, I have a two inch lens in here. Uh, I chose the uh, zirconium selenium lens, which again costs more money, but uh, it can really take power and uh, it does a really nice job uh, you know, at the bottom end where it actually has to do some work. Uh, and finally, I'm, I'm quite happy I chose the Ruida controller. There's, there's a bunch of different controllers out there. Um, and Ruida definitely makes a, a really nice controller. It looks great. Uh, it's very easy to operate and understand and no regrets there. Now, most of the time I'm, I'm attached to light burn, so I don't use the controller. But quite often when I'm standing at the laser, I have to focus, I have to move things around, uh, frame things. It's much, it's much easier to do with this Rowita than some of the other controllers I saw. So, uh, so there's the pros. Uh, you know, of course, I love the fact that this laser just works. All right, as much as I like this laser, there were some things in the end that uh, I really hated and some of them I've already fixed, but, but uh, definitely some of them are still in the laser and I, I live with them. Uh, I may change some of them uh, over time. Uh, first on the list here, some of the mountings. I used a lot of acrylic for these, uh, in part because you can use the laser to cut the parts. So uh, for things like uh, the belt tensioners, I used four millimeter acrylic and thought, hey, this will be good enough. Well, it turns out that four millimeter acrylic, as thick as it is, does flex. So when you're, when you're tightening down the belt, even with moderate tightness, uh, you can see the flex in the belt and then the belt isn't running online with the pulley. So uh, I hated that. Now what I did in, uh, as a solution to that was I got myself some quarter inch aluminum plate and I took those same designs that I had built for the acrylic and put them on my CNC and cut out, uh, cut out metal versions of those parts. And that solved a lot of weird oscillation and vibration in the laser uh, and allowed me to you know, get better output and certainly go a bit faster. Um, next on the list here is the Y-axis couplers. Now, the, the couplers I chose were sort of the standard ones from 3D printers, those, those kind of flexible spring couplers. Uh, the problem is when the laser uh, gantry is moving, it's quite heavy. And it was, as it was moving, it was actually causing those, those couplers to kind of wind and unwind. So they were, they were basically causing a bit of a whiplash effect. Uh, I've since replaced those with solid couplers. Now, of course, that means that the alignment of all those shafts has to be perfect uh, so that you don't end up with weird tension and stress on, on the shafts. But uh, it was, uh, again, it was a worthy and fairly cost-effective upgrade. I had lots of metal couplers from designing 3D printers, and I just stuck those in there to replace those two spring couplers. And everything now, again, it, it's smoother and I can go a little faster. The, the big elephant, which I knew when I, when I built the laser, the big elephant in the room was going to be the belts. I chose six millimeter belts in part because they're cheaper and you can buy lots of different parts uh, to support those belts. Uh, particularly the one on the gantry seems a little uh, weak, we'll say. Uh, so it does bounce around a bit and, and it causes a bit of, of again, whiplash as, as it's trying to move that, that big laser head back and forth. Uh, I haven't fixed that problem yet. I've just simply slowed the laser down a bit. Uh, however, I do have six millimeter uh, belts and pulleys and, and all kinds of kit uh, on order. It just hasn't come in, in time for this video, but uh, I'm gonna upgrade at least the gantry, probably all of the uh, parts to six millimeter belts, uh, just to make it a little more industrial strength and get rid of some of those oscillations. Uh, and last on the list here is uh, the, the ventilation. I have uh, a, a stack where, where the, this, the fumes from the laser cutting get sucked into the back uh, behind the workspace. And I thought it was gonna be a good design. It actually works okay, but uh, between that and the path from, from there uh, to the outside, to my vent outside, uh, there's some kind of a leak somewhere. Now what I did in order to make the laser a little more portable if I had to move it around, 
was I just used two six inch pipe flanges on either side of the cabinet. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that's where it's leaking. So what I'm gonna do is, is just replace that whole thing with a solid six inch pipe and, uh, and just live with it. If I have to move the laser, I'll have to disconnect that pipe and drag it around. Uh, but in the end, I think it'll improve both the, the ability of the laser to evacuate itself as well as get rid of, uh, you know, the occasional smell in my, in my shop as I'm cutting something. It's not terrible, but I can smell it and it's just, it's not cool. So I want to, I want to fix that. Uh, anyway, those are the things I, I liked and, and now the things I, I think I still need to work on. All right, so in quick summary here, uh, am I happy I built this? Yes, uh, both from, from uh, a, a personal satisfaction perspective, it's always kind of cool when you can design something and see it come to life. Uh, but I was most happy about the price. Uh, this laser I mentioned cost me about $4,000 to build. And if I was to buy something, something like uh, an FSL uh, commercial laser to do the same job, it would have cost me about 11, almost 12,000. And I could buy three of these for that price. So, uh, you know, from the price perspective and size performance, everything I'm pretty happy about. Uh, most importantly though, if something ever goes wrong with this laser, I built it so I know how to fix it because I built because I assembled all the parts. So I never have to worry about, uh, you know, whether I can get somebody on a support call. Uh, at least a million people have mentioned to me on this channel that support from any laser company always seems to be miserable. I don't have to worry about that. So. Uh, you know, so that from my perspective where it's part of my business, I need to have a laser that runs, I can fix it myself. And I have, you know, spare parts for all of the, the pieces that are gonna, gonna potentially fail the, the laser tube uh, and a few of the other kind of core parts. So uh, with that, we can wind down. I mentioned that this whole design is available online. Uh, go watch the series of videos I did, but uh, you can download all the SVG files if, you, if you're working with SVG. You can also import uh, the Fusion 360 project that I, I exported and you can put that into uh, Fusion 360 on your own machine and you can make modifications. You can see how things go together. So it's all out there and it's all free. I just want to make people, uh, you know, enable people to be able to build their own things. So with that we can wind down. Uh, as always, get out there, make your world and maybe you want to build an SP 3624 or your own laser to make that happen. So I'll see you next time.